So let's talk about um, um, uh, Anwar al and, um, and 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 the, the, the just as a figure. I mean, this is a. Well, 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 let me ask you this. I mean, obviously, you, um, I don't, I honestly don't know if there's any individual in the world at this point who knows as much about um, uh, how he came to be uh, assassinated uh, or killed by the um, uh, the United States. Um, it, it, literally, I mean, I think you probably know more about this than any. What? But why? Why do you use his story? as the example of this? I mean, what is it about what was done here that is telling of the broader story? Well, you know, I, I remember, um, I actually remembered seeing Anwar al laki on um, television after 9-11. And because at the, at the time I was working for Democracy Now! as a producer, and, you know, we were looking for uh, you know, voices to have on responding to the attacks, and what, we never were able to book him. But one of the people we were looking at was this imam in Virginia named Anwar al and I had heard him on NPR, and he was on PBS, and he had been profiled in the Washington Post for a piece about Ramadan, and he was sort of being presented in the corporate media as um, as the go-to imam, the guy who would help uh, the the uh, American people understand the experience of Muslim Americans in the aftermath of the attacks, and um, and and so I, I he was already on my radar. I knew who he was, and I had totally forgotten about him for years and years. And then the, um, the Fort Hood shootings happened, uh, where Nadal Hassan opened fire on his fellow soldiers, this army psychiatrist, in November of 2009 in Fort Hood, Texas. And all these stories started popping up about how Anwar al had been in email contact with him and was involved with the attack. And when we looked into that, you know, it turns out that, yes, indeed, they were in email contact, but the emails that, that, that have been released show that Hassan was basically just kind of a pathetic uh, stalker who was like asking al to find him a wife and, and asking him all these questions about jihad. And al basically wasn't responding to him at all and was like, oh, yeah, sure, I'll help you find a wife someday. And at this point, al had left the United States. He had been radicalized by watching the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and what happened at Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo and also the treatment of Muslims in the United States and was already on a path to sort of radicalization. Um, when he was in Yemen, where his ancestral roots are, he was born, he was born in New Mexico, but his family is originally from Yemen. Um, he was basically like bouncing around trying to figure out what to do with his life, and he started putting out audio tapes and, um, and publishing blogs. And uh, and the United States had him arrested in Yemen on a kind of trumped up charge of intervening in a tribal dispute, and he was put in prison for 18 months, 17 of them in solitary confinement. And when he came out of prison, uh, you know, Alaki was a very changed man, and he the internet became his mosque, and he developed a very vibrant online community and increasingly radical, radical, radical uh, as the U.S. wars expanded. And um, and then the Dal Hassan shooting happens, Alaki's name gets brought up in it. I think it's 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 quite possible Al-Aki had absolutely nothing to do with planning that operation or encouraging it. But what he did is that the next day he wrote a blog post that said that Dal Hassan is a hero, and then the CIA had his blog shut down, and uh, and then the U.S. Uh, set out to try to uh, to kill him. And the first time we know of that, the U.S. tried to kill Al-Aki was in uh, December 24, 2009, the day before the uh, the so-called underwear bomber tried to bring down the plane over Detroit. And from that moment until September 30, 2011, when Al-Aki was killed. Um, he was on the run, and the CIA and JSOC were trying to kill him. And the reason, the last thing I'll think, say, Sam, is the, the reason that I became so invested in this story is because the idea that you would um, authorize the assassination of a U.S. citizen on the basis of his admittedly atrocious, reprehensible speech uh, felt like such a serious line for us as a society to be crossing. And the fact that only Dennis Kucinich and six other members of Congress said anything about it, they tried to pass a bill that's, that didn't mention al name, but simply said that the president can't extrajudicially kill an American without due process. Only, only six Congress members signed on to it in 2010. It's like, you know, where were the, uh, where were the Tea Party people back then, you know, right. complaining about drone strikes against Americans? Um, but the point is that his father, this, his, the, the, the Nasser al was is this upstanding, amazing, prominent Yemeni academic who was educated in the United States and adored the United States. And, and the, that family let me into their whole archive, and I read essays from various family members. I was able to interview female members of Anwar's family, his sister, his mother, his other siblings, to be around their children, to spend time with them in their home. And to me, it, it, it's a story that represents so much of what's happened, how far across the line we've gone 
um, under a popular Democratic administration. And I think we're going to look back years later and say this was a turning point, the, the month that the President of the United States authorized actions that killed three U.S. citizens, um, two of whom were not even on the kill list. All right. A couple of things I just want to clarify. When, uh, for for yeah. folks who may not um, uh, fully gra- uh, you know, be aware of the story, that when you say you were a producer at Democracy Now! and you were looking at, um, uh, at Olaki as a guest, it was because at that time he was almost like a, a, an ambassador that was sort of, I mean, uh, an informal ambassador to to uh, Islam and sort of... He would have been around. on your show, he, he, if it was today, and we were talking about uh, what happened in Boston and people wanted to sort of understand if, there, if there's a motivation that has anything to do with, uh, you know, sort of with terrorism or, you know, any kind of an Islamist radical group, he would have been the, a guy that they would have had on who would have denounced what happened in Boston and probably right. said, you know, let's not rush to judgment on who, where they are, but here are the sort of players in the world, and this is what I think is a proper response to them. That's what he was doing. He would have been on MSNBC he would have right. been on CNN. Uh, it was a different media culture then. But that's, we were looking to book people like that because we were looking for people who were affected, either because of who they were religiously or ethnically um, or, or just interesting perspectives in general. And al was a guy that the corporate media embraced as a sort of expert on how certain communities were feeling and were impacted by 9-11. Right. In some ways, as pushback to this notion of, like, there's no imams out there who are being, uh, you know, uh, who are being responsible. And, uh, and so... Um, but I couldn't book him, but you know who could? The Pentagon. Uh, the Pentagon. Uh, Anwar Awlaki was invited after 9-11 to the Pentagon to a luncheon and actually gave a speech inside of the Pentagon. And we, we have the emails from the planning of that, and the Pentagon officials are saying that, you know, this is a fascinating guy, and he's going to come in and give a lecture about the role of Islam in the, in the post-9-11 world. And he also conducted prayer services inside of the Capitol in Congress. So, I mean, he was clearly viewed in the chambers of power, even in the defense establishment and Congress, as someone who was an acceptable part of the, the debate in the United States or the discourse on, on, on what our response as a society should be to the attacks. In fact, you, uh, your reporting, you, you think that there may be some reason to believe that the FBI was leaning on him pretty heavily to be an informant. Uh, for oh, they, yeah, I, don't, I don't have any doubt that they were leaning on him. The question for me is whether they flipped him. You know, I, I mean, this is a, it's a complicated story, and if people read the book, I, you know, I, I try to break it down in a, in a digestible way. But the short version of it is that when al was uh, first starting off as an imam, he was living first in Colorado and then in San Diego. And in San Diego, he got busted in 96 on a solicitation of a prostitute charge. And al himself claimed that it was a setup and that the feds tried to then get him to, to start informing on, on members of his mosque and, and basically being a spy for them. You know, and he said that he, he didn't want anything to do with them. Then he gets busted on a similar charge, and he said that also was trumped up, and, uh, and, and that they kept leaning on him. And, and then in D.C., after 9-11, he was pulled in, I think, a dozen times by the FBI, And because it, it turned out that a couple of the 9-11 hijackers had attended prayer services at his mosque. But the 9-11 Commission determined that there was no conclusive evidence he had any actual dealings with them of any relevance. But the, but the point is, Sam, that he clearly was someone that had a lot of interaction with the FBI. Um, I tell a story in my book about how he was driven to a meeting by an FBI uh, uh, informant, with a, another uh, sort of radical uh, guy in Virginia who was an imam and a prominent lecturer who ended up going to prison for being involved with, the, with something called the paintball jihad conspiracy, these guys that were allegedly training to go and fight alongside the Taliban in Afghanistan. But al was driven to this meeting with this guy who then, by an FBI informant who then later gets convicted um, and sent to prison for life for allegedly being involved with this paintball uh, jihad. Um, and, and I spoke to, I've, I've talked to people who worked with the FBI at the time um, who told me that they think that the FBI most certainly was trying to cultivate him as an asset. And, and the question that I think you know, remains to be seen is, what, what did they flip him? Um, what I do know is that when he left the United States in 2002, uh, never to come back again, um, he was under immense pressure from the FBI to cooperate in all sorts of activities. And I think that he, for a combination of reasons, decided it was best for him to head out of town and, and so, he leave. So we'll, you know, we may never know. Only the FBI and, uh, and a dead man know about that. So he goes to, uh, to London for some period of time. He ends up yep. in Yemen. He is imprisoned in Yemen for 18 months, and you, um, you, 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 your, your reporting uh, basically concludes that that is when he becomes um, highly radicalized. 
Um, I'm yeah. skipping ahead here a little bit, but at one point he ends up yep. in Shabwa, which is sort of the, um, I South guess, the, Yemen. The, the, and, and that's a, around the tribal region where his family had come from, yes? I mean, the, Correct, yeah. And, and, and at one point he is, uh, when it becomes clear that the United States essentially is, it has, a, has an issue with him, um, because at the very least, I mean, none of the charges that uh, President Obama has talked about have been substantiated in any way, in any public forum. They may or may not be true. But he is approached by, by uh, Yemeni's uh, security who basically say, yep. look, um, uh, well, well tell, us, tell us what they say to him at that point and when this was. Right. So, um, so after the underwear bomber plot happens, um, you know there there was all there were these declarations in the media that he had met with Anwar al laki this really deranged Nigerian kid in in Yemen that he had met with al laki that al laki gave him his blessing and that um, and that al laki was involved operationally with planning that mission um, and and so in January of 2010, the Washington Post reports that al laki and a couple of other Americans are on a kill list being operated by. JSOC and the CIA. They had to then issue a correction because the CIA said we don't have them on our kill list. So then it was just JSOC that had him on the kill list. Um, and uh, and so they're they're hunting Alaki down. He's hiding in Shebwa. He's moving from house to house. The head of intelligence in Yemen, who is a, a you know U.S. backed guy, comes to the Alaki family, and the Alakis are a very prominent family in Yemen. And um, and and Anwar Alaki's father uh, established the School of Agricultural Engineering at the University of Sanaa. He has multiple degrees from the United States and has you know very close, longtime friends with USAID people and State Department people. And they come to him and they say, look, you know, if you if you don't get Anwar to come back to Sanaa, the capital of Yemen, and basically let us put him under house arrest. And we'll treat him well. The Americans are going to kill him with a drone, and um, and they start warning, you know, the family about that. And um, and in fact, I think the first time that they said that to the family was even before the Nadal Hassan thing. It was in um, it was in May of 2009, which uh, which you know predates all of this stuff by months and months. So clearly, they already the Americans were already telling the Yemeni government, you know, we're going to go after this guy. So they try to get Anwar to surrender. Anwar says to his father, "I'm not going to let the Americans tell me which way to put my bed." Um, and, uh, and that was the last conversation that he had with his dad. And then he went full blown underground. And uh, you know, he t- he took on another wife while he was underground. That actually, their marriage was facilitated by the CIA. Uh, and that's a very long story. But the short of it is that the CIA used this uh, Danish jihad, former jihadist turned informant um, to facilitate finding a wife for Anwar al laki And she was from Croatia. And the woman herself didn't know that that she was being set up. She was she wanted to go and marry Anwar al laki It was like you know e dating for the CIA and the jihadists. And then she. Is is given luggage with a tracking device in it, and uh, and she flies into Sana and Alaki's guys pick her up and they they ditch all of the luggage and all of her things and she disappears and then lives her life underground married to Anwar Alaki. So the CIA facilitated the polygamous, uh, you know, lifestyle of uh, of Anwar Alaki. Now the the reason why I ask about what that that first instance where uh, Yemeni's intel uh, intelligence yeah. basically said you know you're going to get killed and we're talking May 2009 now so uh, the uh, yeah. President this is Obama everything has, happened President Obama's been in it's it's before everything happens it's also presumably um, we're talking about President Obama's been in office now for four or five months ostensibly mm-hmm. right with the the narrative we are to believe is that this structure in which you put an American or anybody on a, a kill list right precedes the time that they're on the kill list right but, well that we knew about I mean we didn't know that's the thing is that it often gets reported that that the you know the kill he was put on the kill list in January of 2010 um, but I, I you know, it, it could have been that he already was on the kill list prior to President Obama taking office. Um, you know, I don't. I don't know of any uh, of any evidence that President Bush tried to kill Al Laki. I do know that he was very much on their radar, and that John Negroponte, who was the director of national intelligence, was instrumental in keeping Anwar Al Laki in prison, and was very angry when the U.S. released him. So I think it's possible that they had determined that Al Laki needed to die uh, when Bush was still in office, and that you know Obama started to intensify the focus on Yemen and made Al Laki sort of target number one. Um, but I do know what I know from my reporting is true is that the Yemeni government, which was cooperating with the U.S., was telling the Al-Laki family that he was going to get killed by a drone if they didn't bring him in. Uh, you know, in in 
mid-2009, before the underwear bomber, before Nidal Hassan, and before the Washington Post said that al Laki was on a kill list. And I, I think that's, that's, that's crucial uh, to understand a couple of things. One is that the whole narrative that we've been told about, that they have developed this uh, sort of legal framework, is really done in retrospect. In other words, I think that's true, and and and, and that I think is 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 crucial. In addition, also to understanding that the narrative that there was actually sort of a uh, that the, he was killed because he was operational in some respect is also pretty suspect.